Christian belief actually built on some research I'm going to talk to you a little bit about in a moment. And uh, you're doing different subjects and you'll know that there are nine different specific subjects. And the team, in their wisdom, in, in uh, seeking to invite me to come and speak to this morning and tonight, this morning uh, felt that it would be helpful for me to do church abuse. Now, I think that's because they didn't want to do church abuse. And so here I am talking about the most contentious and difficult subject in all of the series. I'll, so, I'll tell you why church abuse is on it in a moment, but <coughs> some of you might have seen this movie called Spotlight. Uh, Bill's seen it like me. Both of us watched it on a plane. Spotlight uh, Academy Award winning movie uh, is, is, for those of you who don't know, if you've never heard of Spotlight, many of you would have, but let me give you some background. Spotlight is actually the name of an in, investigative journalism, I guess, team that sits within the Boston Globe. And the Boston Globe is obviously the major newspaper for the city of Boston. And in 2001, they actually started an investigation into the, the Boston Catholic Church and the fact that it knew about abuse of children by priests within the Catholic diocese and had chosen to do nothing about it. Now, it's, an, it's a, a very intriguing, awful insightful story if you ever watched the movie. I would encourage you to see it because it is so confronting and it reminds us about why this subject is such a difficult subject and so important and quite pivotal for our ability to talk about Jesus in the community in which we live now. The, the interesting thing about the Boston Globe and Spotlight, they, they did this investigation. They ran the investigation for many months. It was put off for several weeks because of the 9-11 disaster and all of their reporters were taken off it. And then they eventually published the results and the results were kind of shattering for not only the Catholic Church in Boston, not only did Cardinal Law, who was the head of the Catholic Church, have to step down, but it had ramifications across the world. The interesting thing about this particular story is it is about the church and we're not trying to pretend that this isn't an issue for the church at large and the Catholic church in, in particular. But one of the things that the, the makers of Spotlight did was they made the point that this was actually an issue for all of Boston. Now, it's intriguing that they did that because they could have glossed over a number of factors that they highlighted on the way through this movie. And what they were saying is certainly cardinal law and key leaders within the Catholic Diocese of Boston had behaved very badly, very poorly for the, the community and kids at risk. But they also pointed out that the Boston Globe actually knew about some of these facts for many years and did nothing. Why, why did they even look at it in 2001? Because they got a new editor-in-chief, Marty Barron. And Marty Barron was an outsider he was an outsider to, to Boston and he was an outsider of the Catholic Church. He was a Jew. He came from New York and when he got there, he saw a small, small story <coughs> about a, the, a work of a particular uh, solicitor, lawyer, uh, attorney and he went to the Spotlight Group and he said to the Spotlight Group, why aren't you looking at this issue? And they kind of tried to fob him off and it was only because Marty Barron forced them to do it and as they looked at some of the things that they already knew about, they discovered that 87 priests within the Boston Diocese had been moved around because they had been discover discovered behaving badly, poorly and illegally with children. And rather than being pushed out or brought before the law, they were actually shifted to another parish. When the story broke, it was enormous. And there's a very interesting um, seen just before they're about to publish the story. It's the night before the story is going to be published. It's running through the presses <coughs> and this small team are discussing it. And you can imagine them discussing this. 87 priests, all of these years, all these terrible outcomes for children and for families and for the community. And they're a bit indignant as a group as they talk about what's going to happen tomorrow. And the guy that's heading up the investigation of the Spotlight team sort of stopped them and said, well, you know, we knew and did nothing. And you can imagine what the group is like. 
And they're saying, what do you mean we knew? And he gets, uh, out of, he gets out a small clipping. It's about this big, tiny clipping, story buried late in the paper. And he puts it on the table. And he said, we knew. And this was for, from 10 to 20 years before this investigation. And basically within that article was some of the facts that they'd investigated, but they'd buried it late in the paper and they'd never followed it up. And a couple of the guys in the room say, so who, who ran that story? What department ran that story? Who ran that story? And it turned out that the actor Michael Keaton, who's playing this part, he said, I ran the story. In other words, even in this movie Spotlight, which is very honest and realistic, they're basically saying it wasn't just them out there. There's something dark in the human heart of all of Boston that so many people knew and did nothing. But the problem for us is in the kingdom of God, in the people of, who are following Jesus and those who ought to have the least and the lowliest and the most marginalised and needy within our kind of key way of thinking had actually left kids in awful situations. <coughs> this is a huge issue for the church. This next slide is actually from our research for Towards Belief. When we built Towards Belief, we actually built it on research done across Australia by Mark McCrindle asking the question, what blocks Australians from Christian faith? Now, when we originally planned toward, to do Towards Belief, in my mind, in our team's mind, we never had church abuse on the radar. Just wasn't on the radar. We were looking at, going to look at all the classic, um, classic issues, uh, you know, like the, like the rest of them, like suffering. And tonight, we're going to talk about exclusivity. Is there one way to God? And th those are the classic kind of examples everybody looks towards. But when we got to the research, we saw outcomes like this. And <coughs> this outcome is for people who said they were open to change their mind, but not Christians. That was the key. They were not Christians, but they were open to change their mind. And we're looking at what, what was their response to these issues, like exclusivity right at the top and um, outdated and judging others. Look at the two that are the highest. Now, when we, when we did this for the people who weren't open to change their mind, all of those were way over 50%. Everything was, it's almost like exactly the same. They all had the same outcome. Angry about everything almost, if you weren't open. But those who were open, ready to consider Christian faith in some way, shape or form, look at where church abuse and hypocrisy, which are both linked to each other, sit. They sit way up there. And we did church abuse, not because we wanted to, or we thought it would be popular, or this would be a cracking way to sell a series, <coughs> it was because that says we can't ignore this. And what we discover within the community is on an ongoing basis, we can't ignore this. And the reason this, and, and so this, this morning, I don't see to this morning as a fabulous feel-good message that will leave you uh, what, drifting out of the building on a, uh, a kind of lilting out in wonderful joy. This, this is hard. This is hard material. But it's really important for us to look at it and to, to respond to it. What we see within Scripture is that Jesus' standards for leadership within the church are very high, which again makes this such a difficult issue. There are biblical expectations of leaders. If you know, if you know your Bible well, you might know Matthew chapter 18. And in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus is talking about what it is to be the greatest, what it is to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. <coughs> you'll know for the disciples that was, a, that was a, a kind of debatable issue. It seemed to come up all the time. The disciples were always trying to work out who was the greatest. And keep in mind, this was at a time where humility was not a virtue. Humility was actually seen as a vice. Now that's getting into our other series, the shift where humility shifts from being seen as, as a, a vice to being seen as a virtue. So Jesus is trying to teach his followers what it is to follow him. And he takes a child and puts the child in the middle of them. Now, before I get to what he says, which many of you will know, the importance about a child is that a child, while people, you know, the Greco-Roman world, they love their children, as, as all of us love our children. But there was a situation where kids were not valued in the same way they are now. 
especially newborn babies weren't valued in the way they are now. In fact, boys weren't named for about nine days. Girls weren't named for about eight days. And between when they were born to when they were named, they weren't really viewed as people. In fact, this might surprise you, but many people, many children in, at that time, if you had a baby girl and you wanted a baby boy, which happened a lot, and, and boys were valued, girls weren't, because girls were an economic burden on the family that boys weren't. So often if you had a girl and you wanted a boy, you would expose the baby. In other words, you would take it outside and leave it on a rubbish tip or beside the road. And if somebody picked it up, it would get a life. If it didn't, it died. Now we, we just think, who would do that? Well, that was a fairly normal and usual practice. Seneca, a great Greek thinker of the time, actually said, we drown the infirm at birth. In other words, if you were born disabled would drown you. There wasn't the kind of value on life and the value on children there is today. And so Jesus takes this part of the community that's not seen as particularly valuable and says this. He, he puts a child among them and he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. <coughs> He's lifting the value of children He's demonstrating greatness by choosing that which seems like the least. But then what does he go on to say? But if anyone causes one of these little ones to, who believes in me to sin, it would be better to have a millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Jesus is saying to these people, if you're in leadership, if you care for children who are the most important in the kingdom of God because the least will be the greatest, your role is to protect them. And the times that the church has not protected children is an indictment against the church. And what Jesus goes on to say in Luke chapter, sorry, in Matthew chapter 7 is just as important. In Matthew chapter 7, you remember the beginning of Matthew chapter 7? That's where Jesus says, don't judge. Remember that bit where he says, don't judge? You know that really funny story where he says, why are you bothering trying to take the speck out of your brother's eye when you have a telegraph pole out of yours, a log, a plank of wood. It's kind of funny, really. It's supposed to be funny. Um, so here's this idea. Don't take the speck out of your, your neighbour's eye when you've got a plank of wood hanging out your, your eye. Don't judge because that's the way you'll be judged. <coughs> now that, that seems to sound like we should never make a judgment, doesn't it? And if you ever make a judgment, that's a terrible thing. Except if you read the rest of the chapter. Because what does it say in late, later on in the chapter? In, in, in chapter 7 of, of Matthew, he goes on to say this. Watch out for false prophets. They come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. Now here's my challenge to you. How do you choose a wolf over a sheep if you never make a judgment? Jesus is saying, don't be judgmental. Don't assume that you're always right. Don't assume that you have the ability to pick a speck out of your brother's eye without ever looking at yourself. That's what Jesus is saying. But he's not saying you can't make judgments. And Jesus is basically saying, predicting, <coughs> isn't it interesting, he predicts there will be wolves. There will be wolves. And you need to be ready for wolves. It's not like God is in heaven with Jesus and, and God saying to Jesus, can you imagine? Look at what's happening down there. Can you? I can't believe that happened. No. Jesus is saying, watch out for wolves. And you know what's even more frightening? I, I think this is a really frightening voice. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, the, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles? And what does Jesus say? Then I tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. In other words, there are people within the kingdom of God that Jesus protect, predicts will be wolves who do not have the kingdom of God at their best interests. And they do not have children at their best interests. And our task is to hold the church and to hold leaders to the highest possible standard. And the problem is we haven't done this. So how do we respond? What are some of our thinking? What should we do? And the first thing is to say this, don't defend the indefensible. When you have a conversation with somebody who brings this up, don't try and defend the indefensible. 
There is no way you can pretend that this is a good thing. You can no way pretend that this can be wiped over. You can no way just pretend. I'm not saying that in the Boston area, there wasn't other people who were also to blame. That was the point I'm trying to make. But it doesn't resolve or dissolve any kind of issue for the church. The church must own the places where it's disappointed people. And we cannot try and defend the indefensible. (coughs) If it's illegal, police need to be involved. Now, this is for two reasons. One is, it's the law of the land. If you are involved in a ministry and somebody is accused of acting inappropriately to children, it is not your right to kind of make a legal judgment on that. You actually have to refer it. But the second thing is we refer it because we want to be open. We refer refer it because we want to be as open as we possibly can to the community. We want to be an open door, not being seen as those who have got things to hide. Third, and this is where it gets a little more key, that legal action and personal forgiveness are different issues. Now, we really need to keep this in mind because I think this for the Catholic Church, in my mind, is where the big issue has actually been, where the Catholic Church has in a sense failed. Now, keep in mind, this is not just a Catholic issue, but within Australia... Patrick Parkinson, who you're going to hear from in a moment, actually says that in Australia, the Catholic Church is dealing with six times the number of cases than all other churches combined. So you combine all of the other denominations and churches and the Catholic Church has six times the number that they're dealing with themselves. It's not just about celibacy. Don't hear that. But it's a complex issue. Now, What's happened, though, is there's this sense of forgiving people. And that's what seemed to be happening in, 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 uh, in Boston. There, there's a t- couple of ways of looking at what would happen in Boston or what's happened across churches across the world. One is that they're uncaring leaders who are just trying to protect their name, protect the name of the church, and protect their mates who are other preachers, uh, priests. rather. That may have been the case. But there's also an argument to say they actually believed in forgiveness. And, and if, you look at, if you look at Matthew chapter 6, Jesus calls us to forgive. And this is where it gets complicated. In Matthew chapter 6, it's part of the Beatitudes, uh, sorry, part of the Sermon on the Mount, starts with the Beatitudes, goes on to that section I just read in chapter 7 about judging people. In chapter 6, Jesus talks about what it is to pray. Remember this? And he gives the prayer, which is the Lord's Prayer. There's a line in the Lord's Prayer that we all ought to be careful to pray. Here's what the line in the Lord's Prayer says. Forgive our debts or our sins. Forgive our debts as we forgive. In other words, as in the same manner as we have forgiven our debtors. So in other words, we are praying that Jesus would forgive our, God would forgive our sins in the same manner, same way as we forgive other people. Now, just in case anybody listening to Jesus missed that. He provides a commentary on one line out of the Lord's Prayer. And guess what line it is? That line. So in other words, when Jesus says, this is how you pray, includes that line, he gives a commentary and the commentary is on that line, which says what? It's really important. And what does Jesus go on to say in verse 14? If you, if you forgive people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive people their sins, your heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. Now, in the midst of all of that, there's a question about how do we forgive other people and their behaviour around us? And you have leaders who kind of believe that their task is to kind of forgive people because we are called to forgive and that's our way forward. And yet what we need to see is there's a distance between forgiveness and what we do in an issue of crime. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul was writing to the church at Corinth. It's a pretty dysfunctional church. And he writes to them about a whole bunch of things that they get wrong. Chapter 5, it's about sexual immorality. In chapter 11, it's about how they do the Lord's Supper as a meal together. Uh, In the middle, in chapter 6, Paul actually talks about people who are taking their brothers to court. This is about two men. (coughs) Now, we don't know exactly. If, if, If you read it, it doesn't tell you exactly what it is. But the tone of what Paul is saying 
Seems to look like it was a dispute over finances and money. And in the dispute over finances and money, Paul is saying to these brother, why are you taking your brother to court? Why would you let the unrighteous judge you, the righteous? Don't do that, as it were, sort it out between yourself. Now think about this. If you took that at face value and said, you always sort it out between yourselves, you don't take things to a secular court. And if you add and you forgive your brother as Christ has forgiven you, you can actually see where people make a massive mistake. And they think, well, we shouldn't be taking things to court. We shouldn't be using the secular powers. We should be dealing with this ourselves. But what's really important and people are missing is there's a massive difference between crime and a sin. Here's a boredom alert. I'm about to talk about history. Just stay with me, okay? This could sound dull. It's not. It's really important. In the 11th and 12th century, the church was trying to work out what canon law was. Now, canon law wasn't the law of the community. Canon law was the law of the church. (coughs) And when they're trying to work out canon law, they're trying to kind of decide what is the parameters of the law of the church. And one of the things they did in the 11th and 12th century as Christian leaders and thinkers is they made the distinction between crime and sin. And they said, the government, the secular government, they deal with crime. The church deals with morality and sin. Let me read this little quote. When the secular authority punished punished for robbery, for example, it was to punish for a breach of the peace, for the protection of property, for the offence against society. You get that? Breach of peace, protecting property, the best for society, it, it kind of bringing justice to bear and fairness to bear within the community. Uh, in this world, it began, it began to be said that only the church has the jurisdiction for the, to punish sins. Therefore, therefore, incidentally, the word church had new meaning. Do you get what's happening here? There is issues of crime and there are issues with sin. Now, you can actually forgive somebody from your heart, deep in your heart, and still allow the process of law to take its place and to take its its processes. Forgiving somebody is not letting them off. There are repercussions and outcomes for behaviour that all of us have to face. Forgiveness can actually be a different issue. I mean, this has actually been a massive issue for the Jehovah's Witness uh, organisation come church. I don't know if you know this, but from the 1950s when it started in Australia, they took the line that said, we never take things to court. Do you know that between 1950 and about 1999 when they changed that policy, they had 1,006 registered, as it were, within their own organisation cases of abuse and not one of them went to court. You had the case where a 14-year-old girl brought uh, an allegation against one of the members of the church. The way they responded to it was they called the 14-year-old girl into a meeting with church leaders and the accused abuser in the, org- in the meeting, all of which were older men with this 14-year-old girl with no support, was supposed to bring the case. How far do you think it went? Nowhere. This is, a, this is a case of making sure that we recognise that sin and crime are different things. And the other piece, if you add all these pieces together, the other piece is to miss the difference between remorse and repentance. Here's pa- Professor Michael uh, Patrick Parkinson, who's a professor of law at Sydney University. And uh, we interviewed him because he wrote a book about this before it actually became a big deal And here's Patrick Parkinson talking about that particular issue. So if you can imagine, yes, we are a godly organisation that forgives. No, we shouldn't take things to court. Yes, this person seems remorseful. We should give them a second chance. That that, that sounds completely logical, doesn't it? And yet the outcome of that way of thinking ends up in a movie like Spotlight. And it also ends up with literally, tragically, hundreds and hundreds of cases of children being abused by people who are wolves in sheep's clothing 
when they should have been cut from the pack years before. The one thing I wanted to say this morning is that if you in any way, and this is, it's really important to say this, if you have experienced abuse in any way in the past and you've sat on it for years because you believed you should forgive, you believed that we shouldn't take these things to court, we believed they'll leave this in God's hands, it's actually really important that you talk about it. I don't mean taking an ad out in the paper, I mean to go to one of the pastors personally and individually and bring it up. You know why? Because you don't know, A, it's how you deal with it, but B, you don't know who you're protecting in the future. The more we stay silent about this, of what's happened in the past, the more we open some innocent child to an abusive situation in the future. And it's important for us to act. One of, the, one, of the, one of the things about focusing a bit on the Catholic Church this morning is to actually downplay all other denominations. And most people will know, most people will know that Brian Houston has spoken publicly about his enormous disappointment as a 50-year-old man to find out that his dad, one of the biggest names in Pentecostalism in this country, left behind in New Zealand several cases of abuse of children. And Brian Houston said publicly on, I think it was Channel 9 last year, that my dad was a pedophile and that that absolutely broke me as a person. Now, it can be in any organisation, any church, any place. But don't confuse forgiveness with crimes. Don't confuse remorse with repentance. Don't confuse staying safe with protecting a child in the future. But don't ever lose the fact that Jesus rebuilds lives, that Jesus remakes people, that Jesus puts people back together again, that Jesus is broken more than the child or the family or the church is, that Jesus must be destroyed if we can use the human term for Jesus, for what he sees. But Jesus rebuilds people. And whether this sort of abuse or another sort of abuse is your experience in life, the wonderful news, it's not going to be wiped off just easily, but God can remake you. When we did this series, we wanted to interview somebody (coughs) who had been through abuse and had come out the other side a renewed person. You know, we'd basically given up trying to find somebody. We actually went to Catholic leadership and Anglican leadership, church leadership in Australia and said, this is what we're looking for. Who do you think we could interview? When you think about all the number of cases, nobody would talk about it. Nobody would come on. Now, I can understand why, because it's an incredibly difficult thing to do. And what we wanted to show is that Jesus does rebuild people and that there is a future after this. And we're about to fly to America to film in America and we'd set up a, an interview with a guy called Dale Keane who a- happens to actually also is one of the very few people is in the new series in a different area because Dale Keane is a professor um, in politics at St. Amsom's University in New Hampshire. And we were going to interview Dale Keane and uh, basically the day before we were leaving to fly to America to, f- to do all these interviews and Jane, who's the, my wife, the producer of the series, sent all these emails saying, are you ready? We're going to be there. He emails back and says, oh, yes. And by the way, you might want to watch a couple of these Vimeos just to give you some background. Well, one of the Vimeos was a story of his mum ringing him. And his mum had rang him just a few years before we did the interview. And his mum had rung him to say, and this is what he says on the Vimeo, said that um, his best mate, that he'd grown up through school with. Well, maybe he's not his best mate. One of his mates that he grew up through school and through the local church with had just tried to commit suicide. And Dale said, why, why did he do that? And his mum said, well, it's really complicated. He, he went to the church leadership of which his father, this guy's father, was one of the members of the church leadership. He'd gone to the church leadership to, the, to complain that the pastor that they'd grown up with, the pastor of their church, The pastor had been the youth pastor and then the pastor of the church had been abusing him sexually for years. And he goes to the leadership and he tells them this. The leadership talk to the pastor and the pastor say, well, that's not true. It's just a part of his pathology. I'm trying to get him past that. And the the church leadership decided it wasn't true. And when his own dad and the church leadership decided it wasn't true, he went out and tried to take his own life. And his mum said to Dale on the phone, so what do you think? (laughs) 
And Dale's response was, it's true because it happened to me. And it was the first time he ever mentioned it. Dale's not a part of a legal action against the pastor, but there are 215 people that are. And so Dale tells the story. And, and it's difficult because one of the things I want, to, want you to know is that Dale now is a professor of politics at St. Amsterdam's University. He's a follower of Jesus and he's part-time. He pastors churches. He leads churches. And we would talk to Dale. It's the, the rawest interview because it's the most honest and authentic that I've ever done. Because when I asked him, one of the questions, and this leads into the section you're about to watch, I asked him, so have you forgiven him? And Dale's answer was, not yet. And Dale reflected on where he sat in all of this, in this clip. And we come this morning to say to you that whatever's happened in your life, whether it's as serious as the sorts of things that Dale is dealing with, or it's a crossword, or a broken relationship, or poor behaviour, there's no point beating up on Jesus and beating up on the church when it's our only hope. That's what we believe in. We don't believe in perfection out of leadership. We don't believe in perfection out of other people. We don't believe that we ought to be, per people ought to expect us to be people perfect, but nor should we expect anybody else to be perfect. But in the midst of that, there's a sense of, I need to forgive and I need to let it go and I need to find the future. As I said before, if, if there's some sort of serious abuse that you have had to deal with, you, you need to get help on that. Sitting on it is not going to help you. But all of us, all of us, every one of us need to understand that Jesus reaches out a hand of grace, love, mercy and renewal. And if Dale can move forward out of his situation, I know under the power and the spirit and the grace of God, you can move forward under yours as well. I don't say that as some sort of glib, throwaway, positive, positive line that everything is rosy. I'm saying it because in the hard stuff of life, in the difficult, difficult moments, if, if our faith means anything, that's when it means something. That's when it matters. We don't, we don't demonstrate our faith when things go incredibly well and we're doing brilliantly. That, that's easy. If I could be so blunt, any pagan can do that. But in the hardest moments of life, when you're struggling to understand, know that God stands there with you. God loves you. God loves you to the very core of who you are. God forgives you for the stuff that you've done. God is calling to forgive you to forgive the others for the stuff they have done. And that's where the future lies. I want to pray for all of us because every one of us faces that dilemma to all different degrees. Will you pray with me?